My name is Michael Kutsunis, and I'm a policy researcher for Vocal Europe. On today's podcast interview, we will discuss the ongoing developments in Afghanistan, the rise of the Taliban, and the role of the European Union. We're honored to be joined by Ms. Claire Daly, a member of the European Parliament, the Vice Chair of the EP Delegation for Relations with Afghanistan. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, Ms. Daly. Thanks very much for having me, Michael. Obviously, it's terrible that we have to talk about the topic, but I'm very glad that the attention is finally being put on Afghanistan because for 20 years, really, a blind eye has been turned on it, you know, in the sense of public opinion in, in Europe and around the world. I completely agree. Maybe that is the only silver lining out of this whole crisis. Exactly. Um, to begin with, can you please share with us what was your initial take on the recent shift of power in Afghanistan? Yeah, I mean, look at the same as everybody else, the speed and relative ease of the Taliban takeover took everybody be by surprise. But that said, I have to say I'm not surprised that the Taliban has taken over and anybody who had paid even a fraction of interest to what was really going on in Afghanistan would have known how uh, dominant they were in the rural areas and indeed in some of the urban areas. And, uh, you know, it was ironic. We had a meeting in the European Parliament just before the summer when speakers from the Afghan government were um, arguing with some MEPs who said, oh, well, are the Taliban not, you know, gaining ground? Is it not likely that they will easily take over? And they told us, absolutely not. That is fake news. But it wasn't. And I mean, you know, the speed just shows what sort of nation was being built in Afghanistan because the reports we were getting officially here were, oh, yes, there were gains being made, progress wasn't too bad. Clearly now that has been exposed as a lie. Um, and there needs to be very hard questions asked and lessons learned for the EU on that. I mean, I think obviously, like everyone, the speed of the takeover has resulted in absolute panic and chaos now in Afghanistan between people trying to flee on the one hand, and then the huge economic crisis, the food crisis, the lack of a, a functioning economy is all bringing huge pressures to bear as well. So it's just a total nightmare. Uh, and as you said, the only good thing is that the eyes of the world are on it and we have to make sure that they stay on it and that uh, assistance is given, but proper assistance this time. I completely agree with you. So now that we've come to this point, what are the sort of and long term challenges to the European Union in regards to the Taliban takeover? To what degree is the European Union prepared to handle incoming Afghan refugees, for example? Yeah, I mean, it's that's a very complicated question in some ways, and it, it has very many aspects to it, you know, because I suppose there's a difference between what the European Union uh, deemed to be a challenge and what is actually a challenge. And then there's a conflict between, I suppose, what they should do and what they will do. So, you know, the truth is somewhere in between all of that. I suppose the first lesson for me and what it should be is that interventionism does not work and the lesson should be learned. And sadly, it doesn't seem like it will be learned because the high representative's response was to say, Oh, do you know what? Now, I think we need an EU army. Well, for me, that's the actual lesson is that's the last thing we need. Uh, we absolutely don't need uh, an EU army. We need to keep out of military interventions in other people's countries because they do not work. And we have to develop an independent foreign policy, not just linked to following what the United States does. But I mean, I suppose that is a long term challenge and the influence of the military industrial complex in Brussels and in the EU is going to be resistant to that line of argument. The shorter term challenges, I mean, for me, the challenge is not for the challenge is for the Afghani people themselves. And the role of the European Union should be to facilitate those who need humanitarian assistance. And there's going to be loads of them. Um, let's face it. So, I mean, there's a couple of things. I mean, it is true what they say, that the European Union needs to direct its aid and assist the nearby countries like Pakistan and Iran, which will take a lot of uh, refugees. But Europe itself has to open its borders and offer a very generous resettlement program, and not just to the people who worked with the EU or others, but people who want to um, 
escape the country and who have a valid claim to do that. So I would be very much in favour of a really um, big resettlement programme throughout the EU. I mean, it's ridiculous, ironic. We had a, a conference yesterday on the shortage of labour across Europe. You know, the European Union would benefit from having these people, apart from the fact that we were responsible for what happened in Afghanistan, and we should be taking large numbers of people there. We should be assisting financially the nearby countries, but we also need to, um, you know, is the EU better equipped? I don't know. Let's see what they come out with. The Interior Minister's statement it was very disappointing, really. Some countries have been positive. I mean, in my own country, actually, the people of Ireland have been really welcoming. They've been horrified by what's gone on, which is bad on the one hand because, you know, life was difficult in Afghanistan before now, and where were they then, you know? But it's good that at least they're engaged now and demanding that our government uh, do um, respond positively in a humanitarian sense. So for me, the EU says that's a problem. Migration is a problem. It's a challenge. For me, it isn't. You know, the only challenge is, is that that's where they need to, dir to direct their resources and link in with the member states. And I think they're going to have to. Probably not as much as I would like, but they will a bit, you know. Yes, I completely agree. Um, to what extent should the EU deal with the Taliban in your opinion? Are operational talks a prelude to the formal recognition of their regime? I don't think so. And I wouldn't think, particularly with the line out of the interim government, I don't think there's going to be uh, any recognition of that per se. I mean, in some ways, um, you know, I mean, how do they have to deal with Well, they have to deal with them is the first thing. They are the ones who've taken power now in Afghanistan. And okay, we've an interim government. We will have a real government at a certain stage, uh, you know, whether that will include other groups or not, who knows, obviously there's no other groups involved at the moment, so it doesn't look good, um, but the EU has to deal with them because they are the leadership in Afghanistan and if they need to get humanitarian aid in, if they want to have any influence over the direction of that country in terms of the position of women and girls, rule of law, all of those uh, things, then they need to talk to them. Because, like, what's the alternative? R launch another war? N don't think that works. Soviet Union found that out. The US found that out. We've got to deal with the hand that you're dealt with. So they have to talk. And I'm actually glad that the high representative and the officials have adopted that tone. They are talking to them, and they should. It's a practical question. It's not one of, of political um, sponsorship or agreement. It's a practical question, and, 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 and they, they have to do that. Thank you. Uh, which leads us to our next question. We have seen the Taliban make certain pledges to the international community. As an example, they have promised to protect the rights of women and religious minorities. Do you personally believe the Taliban have actually changed? Can they be trusted to adhere to their promises? No, I don't think the Taliban have changed. You know, they are a fundamentalist uh, believers in an Islamic emirate. Uh, which will mean life will be very difficult for women and girls, um, and it was as it was before. So there is, and we can see it in the panic and chaos now. I mean, there is an argument to say, let's look at what the Taliban has actually done so far since the situ since their takeover. And it's true that they took over without a shot being fired, really, in Kabul. Obviously, people were executed in some areas, but, you know, that's, I'm not saying it's acceptable, but this is what happens when you have a change of power in a country. By all means, the um, violence was relatively low, considering what would have happened in other countries. And the panic and the chaos of people fleeing and so on wasn't necessarily as a result of anything that the Taliban had done, but a fear of what they were going to do. So it is true to say we have to judge them on their actions. And their actions so far have been making nice talk. They haven't actually done anything too bad yet. Obviously, there's a rowing back on women's rights, and I don't agree with that. Like, you know, so, but they are saying that, you know, 
women will be allowed to go to school, but they'll curtail their areas. They don't have to wear a full burqa. They don't have to go out with men. But then on the other hand, we see the actions which are setting up the new Ministry of Vice or whatever it was called before. They've re-established this ministry, which under the previous Taliban rule, were the ones to go around and inspect whether Sharia law was being rigorously implemented everywhere and by everyone. So I think there's conflicting signals. They haven't changed whether they will be more sophisticated in implementing their rule is something that's open. I think the fact that the other countries who are working with them, uh, namely Qatar, Pakistan, Iran, Russia, China, all of them will be saying, listen lads, you know, can't be the same as the last time. If you think it's going to be a replica and the international community is going to give you the recognition that you want and the support that you need, ain't going to happen. Uh, and they're the ones who are kind of the nearest to them, if you like, their demands are going to be less than what the US and the European Union would look for even more, you know. And I think the indications are that the Taliban does want to have a working relationship with all of its neighboring countries primarily, but also beyond, including with the United States. I mean, let's face it, it was the negotiations between the Taliban and the United States that led to this situation anyway with the U US announced. So they want to work with everybody. Um, so how it's going to pan out? Well, we don't actually know. I mean, they do want to establish uh, um, uh, an Islamic Emirate. They do want to have that type of rule, but whether it can be a carbon copy of the last time, mm, I don't think that's feasible or if they do go down that road, it's going to end up for them without rec international recognition, without a lifting of the sanctions on a number of their, their people, which they so desperately want. And it's going to make it difficult to get the resources and the help and the expertise externally that they're going to need to run the economy. Because I think the economic challenges now are coming to the fore. People can't get access to the banks. Uh, obviously, the drought has led to huge problems already. Millions were in danger of poverty, were in poverty and at risk of hunger. Now that's getting really, really bad. So um, basically, short answer, no, I don't think they've changed. Um, will they operate more skillfully? Yes, I think so. Can they be trusted? Well, nobody knows. Uh, we haven't seen the evidence of it yet. Uh, and let's judge them on that. It's... The, ju the jury is out on that one so far. But I think the announcement of the government will have some people concerned, but it is only an interim government at the same time. So let's wait and see what happens next. Thank you. Um, this leads us to our final question of the day. What foreign policy tools does the EU have to ensure that the Taliban do not commit the atrocities of the past? Of course, you just mentioned sanctions, but uh, are there any other foreign policy tools that can be implemented? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I turned that question on its head a little bit as well and kind of who appointed the EU as the moral policeman of the world as well? Like, do you know what I mean? And, and they need to, this idea that we know best is, I find a little bit offensive. I mean, if you think about it, some of the media headlines across Europe over the last while has been about, you know, the Taliban beating protesters, you know, and I utterly condemn uh, the beating of protesters anywhere. But I mean, the police in France regularly beat protesters. They've even killed them. You know what I mean? So for the EU to be lecturing other countries, they need to look inside themselves first. Uh, that's the first thing, because any third country would say, sorry, why should we take advice from you? Of course, what the EU does have and has used in Afghanistan is aid and money. And I would be very strongly of the opinion that we need to keep using that money and that investment. And it's a large investment. They were talking about a, a billion euros um, each year, I think. So it's a lot of money. And the Taliban do need that money. And they need to attach conditions to that in terms of humanitarian access, in terms of the right of women women and girls in the protection of the Hazara minority and any others. This idea of extrajudicial killings, um, which the Americans have been responsible for as well, but it's not acceptable for them. It's not acceptable for uh, the Taliban. So I think they need to use that money uh, skillfully. And I think they need to work with the, with the Taliban because so far they've said that they will allow people to leave who have official documents from uh, other countries. So the EU member states now need to get all their uh, governments 
working, their embassies working to work with them to secure that. So I think they are the leverage that they can use. I think they will be looking for skills as well to run the economy. The expertise probably is certainly isn't there in the hands of the Taliban alone. So they need the educated Afghani citizens and they need external support as well. So I think the EU can use that leverage also. I'm not in favour of sanctions. The last thing um, uh, Afghan, Afghan people need now is sanctions. They're starving enough as it is, um, but absolutely with the, uh, the sanctions, no, definitely not. It would be the people who would suffer. Thank you. This concludes our discussion for today. Ms. Daly, I would like to thank you for taking the time to speak with us and offer us your insights on Afghanistan. Thanks very much, Michael. Pleasure was all mine. It was a pleasure and an honor to have you as our guest. Thanks a million. See ya. Bye bye.